And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a returning good brother to the temple. One one part of the of the madhouse that is Parable Games, formerly uh, formerly of Shiver fame, and now coming back coming back to the realm of horror with Shiver Gothic, and a, and an appropriate time it, as it is. The one and only Barney Menzies. How are you doing today, hello, man? Hello. Or tonight, I guess, in your case. You. Yeah, it's it's this evening here. The the wonder of time differences. <laughs> I'm still ma I'm still mad at Australia for deciding to think that a couple thirty minute time zones was a good idea. <laughs> yeah, it's it's not not the wildest on not the wildest fan of that. I mean, I know it's Australia and everything in Australia wants to kill you, but still. Apparently, you can add time to the list of things that wants to kill you in Australia. So. Yeah, because it wasn't it wasn't bad enough having sit having Sydney's roads around. <laughs> but I the reason I mentioned this before we went live, but the reason I find it a bit um, a bit amusing releasing some, releasing um this Kickstarter for Shiver Gothic in the month of March is I think a couple of days ago we had was the 100 year anniversary of the first airing of Nosferatu. Yes, yes, the classic. We were chatting about that earlier about about how the Stoke family probably aren't too pleased the, about that film's continued existence. And but it's yeah, you were saying that you, you kind of got the got that kind of vibe from the the front cover of the Spy Home book. Mm -hmm. Well, to well to be well to be fair, um, a lot of. The, a lot of the shiv a lot of the shiver art is a ga is a game of spot the reference. I've noticed. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> oh. We have a lot of, have a lot of fun drawing from popular culture. I mean, also if you're trying to um, if you're trying to cover a genre as a whole, it's uh, it's 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 one way to to tie in what you're creating with um, the reference points that people are going to understand. Mm -hmm. I think plus plus there's a lot of ways to do a lot of ways to reference this kind of thing in a form that's legally distinct especially since I'd say most people who are going to be picking up Shiver are on some level horror fans. So yeah, gonna absolutely. Few, they're going to know a thing or two about this kind about this kind of thing. Yeah, they're going to spot 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 the reference from a mile away and like we try we try and add like sort of levels of of reference so that you, there's some stuff that you'll easily find as a as a cursory kind of horror fan, and then there's some stuff that you, you're only going to find if you're, if you're deep into into the genre. Mm -hmm. oh. And I'm I'm just putting I'm just putting it out there. If there's a, if there's a bit of art either it either in um, either in Spireholm or something else that is referencing Dr. Caligari, I called it. <laughs> you have to dig into the book for that one. <laughs> uh, but I, I suppose I, sh I suppose I should start off with the fact that when I did my when I did my initial review of Shiver, I had I had said that it was only a matter of time before I would see genre focused um, supplements um, or subgenres if I want to get more specific ones that weren't leaning for the kitchen sink approach that the core book was, but more towards specific styles of horror. Since, obviously, over over the last century, there's been a multitude of sub-styles sub within that. Um, and of all the of all the ones, all the sub-genres to go with, why did you guys choose gothic horror to be the first ones to get the treatment? So, I mean, the, uh, one of the reasons we chose gothic horror is it's, I, I think, probably the most widely accessible genre of horror. Uh, it's the one that most people would be able to reference the key themes, 
Um, you see it kind of bleeding into other role playing games as well. If you look at something like Curse of Strahd and D and D, the 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 wider role playing game audience, even if they're not necessarily deep in horror games, still has like an understanding of vampires and werewolves and mystery and smoky sort of cobbled streets. And so it's it's a really easy um, touch point for people to jump into Shiver and play some stories that maybe they're already interested in telling and also have maybe even seen before or read before. Mm-hmm. Um, from your perspective, what's the appeal of gothic horror compared to other subgenres? Um, so I think probably for me, the the most interesting thing with gothic horror is the, the, the way that you can insert... Um, sort of very human but also very tragic themes into your stories um if you look at things like the story of frankenstein it's 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 fundamentally quite a tragic story um and it allows you to tell these um scary tales but also have a level of narrative and character depth to them that's beyond a beyond the surface of just scares you're, you're 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 digging slightly deeper into the world with with it um which is obviously where the genre comes from as a whole is the the, the writers of the era where gothic literature was huge were using it as a, a subtext to talk about the world as it was then mm-hmm. and within within that we there has been, there has been a there has been a bit of a tr- there has been a bit of a trend of of taking taking certain archetypes in gothic horror and doing the um, things that bump in the night, bumping against worse things that go bump in the night. Um, and I'm cu- I'm curious if that's some if that's something that could be could theoretically be supported within Shiver Gothic. Yeah. So we one of the things that we added was. Um was a set of rules that allow you to play as classic gothic monsters so you can play as i mean we had were- werewolf rules in the the original book but we have expanded sort of beast rules we have things like you can play as the invisible man um a frankenstein's monster star character like all of those classic um gothic monster tropes um we've brought over to the player side of the aisle as well as the the enemies um and, and the one of the reasons we did that is where we wanted to allow players to explore the experience of one of those like monstrous characters um in a in a world where they would be perceived as monsters and so it, it generates some interesting role playing possibilities um we're big fans of things like uh, the League of Extraordinary Gentlemen, um, Hellboy, and that they they tell very similar stories in that regard of monsters that are ultimately fighting for for good, but not recognised by the society in which they're fighting for. Mm-hmm. Um, so we we wanted people to be able to tell those stories, um, but also on the other other side of the coin, we wanted to you to be able to tell the very human stories that you find in Gothic horror, where it, there's a lot of oh, well, we present you with this monster who on the surface level is bad and awful, and then you, as, as you progress through a narrative, you suddenly re- you realise slowly that the, the humans in the story are, are doing way worse things than the monster most of the time. Yeah. Incidentally, I, um, I enjoy the fact that you put a bit of a bingo sheet regarding your inspirations. I think you're the first person I've seen to do that since uh, Mothership. Which, there's, there's, what I, what really struck me about that, about the, about that particular sheet is the variety, the variety in tone. Because you have some, you have some, you have some that are going, you have some that are going to be plenty, um, on the more traditional ends. But then you have, but then you have entries that are far, far less grim and far less serious in tone like say, like say the like say the watch series with discworld or um to or to a cert- or to a cert- to a certain extent the i'd say but i'd say putting in buff i'd say putting in buffy even the 
even though um, that had its serious moments as as well. But just th just that variation. Um. Yeah, we we wanted to um, we we wanted to kind of show the breadth of of things that we were drawing on. I think one 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 thing that you can run the trap of with gothic horror is you you can you can make it very po faced and serious, but there's a lot of m more modern adaptation of gothic horror that that takes it to a uh, a slightly more pulpy end. Um, so there's a, a you can you can really twist it any which way really. Um, so that's why one of the reasons why we've got such a breadth of um, inspiration there. Um, also, we are we're, like the narrative that we're providing with the Shiva Gothic books has a variety of different uh, of our own sort of twists like that on on the Gothic horror kind of genre. Um, and so we wanted to express kind of like a lot of where we're drawing from on that front as well. Similarly, um, artistically as well, with the style of the illustrations and how we're portraying the world, there's a few a few um, references in that grid to some of the things that we've drawn on um, stylistically as well. Yeah, and I think what what I think what's um what's also what's also telling in that regard is well. Obviously, with a lot of the pioneers of gothic horror, um, have their have their origins in Europe and espe especially Eastern Europe. And at the same at the same time, when I look at that inspiration list, I see things like Vampire Hunter D, which is far, is um, very far removed from Europe from European, um, just. Or at least, at least the trappings of what people would consider um, gothic horror, which I think is a good thing to make sure that you don't fall into the um, fant fantasy is fantasy is Britain tra trap that a lot of um, fantasy writers do. Yeah, absolutely. We wanted to take because um, the themes of gothic horror, like you can you can apply across a, a multitude of of settings and ideas um, and. We there's some of the treatments that um, sort of, uh, especially Japan, have done um, in terms of taking gothic themes and, and reappropriating them into new narratives and new styles. Uh, if you look at something like um, the Castlevania series, that's a, a great example of the sort of almost a modernization of the Dracula myth. Um, and I, I think it's you, you can't really you can't really tell. Um, a modern, a modernized Gothic story without looking at all of those broader reference points as well. Mm -hmm. um, also, it's, it's, it it serves your players um, well because there will be some people coming to play Shiva Gothic who have seen Vampire Hunter Steel or uh, drawing on similar similar references and will want to experience the world through that lens. Yeah. Um, and hey, I'll give I'll give you props for using the better Vampire Hunter D movie. <laughs> the original is the original is all right, but Bloodlust ha Bloodlust had um, Kawajiri involved. You're not you're not you're not topping that. <laughs> uh, gr uh, gr granted, the, granted the books are a lot. The book was a lot different, but that's a whole other story. It's a um, whole another whole another and. Thing. The the other reason that I brought up something like something like the Watch series is well. Even Discworld is not is not what I would consider a serious fantasy realm. Oh, it cer it certainly has its serious moments, but it but there's always there's always a tinge of there's always a there's always a tinge of dry humor with within it. Um, not too far not too f much in the same way that. Even though Red Dwarf has its serious moments, it is st it is still leaning towards a comedy. Mm -hmm. Um, a, a comedy that a comedy that made a young me scared of penguins for about a week. <laughs> <laughs> but, reg oh, also, also, also the age-old lesson of don't put ketchup on lobster. <laughs> who the hell? Do I'd say who the hell does that, but Patrick Mahomes puts ketchup on steak, which is arguably worse. 
Oh, I don't actually know which one of those is worse. I think I think ketchup on lobster is worse, but it's pretty close. Yeah. But shifting into um, archetypes, I'm, I I mentioned in the in my review that I loved the um, archetype system, but there's a couple of things. I'm, there's a there's, before I get into the new ones. Um, something I'm curious about is the uh, is for doing for doing gothic horror. Are there is the book going to have any changes to the human archetypes that were in the core book to ref, to reflect the to reflect the setting the um, style change or is are they largely untouched? So the the humans the human archetypes that are in the the core rulebook will largely remain the same. A lot of the reflavoring that we're doing there is through the backgrounds. Um, so we'll be providing a, a new set of backgrounds for for that will sort of cover the gothic genre and allow you to flavor your character very specifically to certain ideas. Mm -hmm. um, the only other sort of human element that we've added some some intrigue to is on the sort of the slayer archetype, which is the the gothic style survivor. Um, which which has um, has some elements of uh, the sort of Van Helsing style character um, and, and characters of that similar vein as the, the the very directly opposed antagonist to monsters. Mm -hmm. um, but generally, um, we found that the the human archetypes cover most of the gothic roles you're going to want to play. Um, you're just maybe. <laughs> substituting the the kind of uh, pet you choose for your companion path, for example, or something like that. But the the abilities themselves um, still ring true in the gothic genre for the most part. Yeah. Speaking of that, I'd like to touch on the new the um, new archetypes that you get that you guys have. Starting with the construct, which is I'd I'd say your XP for um for 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 uh, Frankenstein's monster and and the like. Everybody always calls it everybody always always confuses the monster with the doctor. Yeah, that's the the classic the classic mistake, isn't it? That it's 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 the monster and not Frankenstein. But, um yeah, so the, the the construct is is yeah, quite rightly identified as the uh, sort of Frankenstein's monster, but it's also um it's it's slightly more than that in that the it, it's focused on any character that is constructed in their being. So yes, we have the Frankenstein's monster, um, and the, the the there's a kind of a split that we've established with this in terms of the material and construction of the character. So Frankenstein's monster is a construct of flesh. We also have rules for constructs of. Um, stone and constructs of science um mostly the, the science element is a, a more mechanical look at the construct for things like automata and um and things of that nature mm -hmm. whilst the, the flesh is flesh is the more classic frankenstein's monster and then stone looks at um uh things brought to life um things like statues or golems or um other other sort of more naturalistic idea of the construct where the construct is created by um by emotion or uh, magic or something along those lines if somebody wanted to do a a setup akin to swamp thing could they use the construct archetype to lean into that um i, th I think you could certainly um just I'm trying to remember the back background of swamp thing he so the the construct is 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 yeah it's it's the idea that it's being created so if if your character's background has has a creation element if you've been experimented on by a mad scientist then that's kind of where the construct would also lie but if if you yourself are the the scientist that's done the experiment on yourself if you if you think a sort of Bruce Banner scenario or um, similar, then uh, we have a path in the mad scientist that's all about self-experimentation. Mm -hmm. 
So it's 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 we we've tried to give people not only sort of a way to define their characters through the abilities that they would have, but also think about narratively how those characters have got to that point and provide that distinction as well. Because a lot of a lot of the interesting parts of the monster is their their origin and how they came to be a monster. And so we wanted to make sure that we conveyed that really clearly as well. Mm-hmm. And next the next one I want to cover is the beast, which I think a lot of people will look at will look at the classical um Lycanthorpe with the classical Lycanthorpe weaknesses. But I'm curious if things like um if things like skit if things like skinwalkers or other other um tra- or other transformations besi- besides a werewolf would be on the table. Yeah, so we we wanted to make sure that we covered a slightly broader variety of sort of beasts for for that archetype in particular. Um so the main the main thing that we wanted to focus on um with the beast is is the theory of transformation um so uh, transforming your form in one way or another um to to become something else and that, that yes yeah, skin walkers would be a great example um i know that we had like um doppelganger rules in the in the book in the core book as well and so it's, it's looking at ideas like that and that idea of transformation that also often comes with um, a, a an increase in dexterity um, and litheness um, as opposed to a transformation that makes you more lumbering um, like a like a construct usually would be. Um, so it's tying kind of those two ideas together and working out how how best to show the breadth of of those ideas. So next would be the mad scientist, and as as amusing as it is that the art that you used is an XP of the Invisible Man, um, I'm cu- I'm curious if uh, if using if using this could if using the mad scientist archetype could cover um, something like Doctor Jekyll and Mister Hyde. So it, it definitely could. One of the one of the things that we did um, in the core book is that there is uh, already some abilities within the uh, that path for a, a Doctor Jack or Mister Hyde style character. Um, so we wanted to explore the Mad Scientist in a bit more breadth than just the Doctor Jack or Mister Hyde character. So we've kind of one of the paths is of a similar vein, but about different kinds of self experimentation, um, and because it 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 interacts with the scholar um, archetype really easily, um, we're going to make it so that you can kind of dip in and out of the archetype. So that if you want to create Doctor Jekyll, then you can you can grab those abilities from the core book and then mix them with your mad scientist path too. To generate the the a, 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 an even more complex um, scientist, but the one of one of the other focuses um, that we had for the mad scientist was we had the constructs end of um, the Frankenstein's monster equation, and so we wanted to look at well, what if we have a character that is actually Doctor Frankenstein and wants to make their own um, companion. Um, and so it, it, that kind of plays uh, on a similar vein to the companion path that the socialite had in the core book of making its own own monsters. Mm-hmm. Now, next next on the list would be the immortal, which isn't it? It's an interesting name setup because I think a lot of people would look at it and think va- and think vampire, but I don't think you're limiting yourself to just that. Especially since you referenced the portrait of Dorian Gray earlier on. Yeah, absolutely. We we wanted to we wanted to make sure that we had um, multiple options for the immortal. Um, it, it, it would it would be an absolute blast and very easy for us to write just an entire ability tree for vampires. Um, but what we wanted to do was give players a little more breadth to explore immortality from a number of other avenues as well be they cursed in some regard um 
similar in in Dorian Gray really is ultimately cursed um or if they be vampires or through other some other kind of magic or or contract um and, and what that allows you to do is it means that if you do want to go up the vampire a bit a, like path you will have access to sort of the abilities that vampires are uh, well known for, but the uh, the issue with a lot of those abilities is they do come with drawbacks because vampires quite famously have a lot of weaknesses and well known drawbacks. And so we wanted to make sure that players who wanted to go down that immortality route but not maybe take that massive risk reward on the power versus weaknesses approach had had another way that they could attack that archetype. Mm-hmm. I do rem- I do remember running a. Um... It was it wasn't ra- it wasn't Raven Lost, but it was a different it was a different um, horror game, and I wanted um one of and one of my players wanted to do the immortal archetype, but wanted to do something didn't wanted to do something different with it, and the approach I ended up coming up with was the de- was the um death list the idea that um some that something about something about them just makes things related to de- related to death recoil to the, to the point where um <laughs> go where ghosts and spirits experience pain when he when they're around yeah oh yeah just, like a, like an almost like a fear an underworld like block that makes things from the other side fear the yeah, that's cool i like that yeah the key thing the key thing with it was was that Whenever he, whenever he, whenever he showed up with the party, um, if there was a sp- if there was a spirit or a local deity or or the like, they'd always be in a very bad mood because why? Because why? The, why the hell are you bringing that thing here? <laughs> oh, the inspiration was was a bit based on a bit based on the um per, on the pariah in Warhammer Forty K's lore. Yeah, the sort of like psychic null, but a null for death instead. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's that's I like that idea a lot. Yeah. Uh, the next is the lucky devil, which um, I don't know. I don't know why, but when but when I saw the description for the lucky devil, my mind immediately went to both Constantine and the huckster archetype in Deadlands. Interesting, yeah. So Constantine's definitely like a kind of a kind of inspiration there. Um, sort of maybe slightly a slightly more comical Constantine, um, almost. Um, we actually have a, an illustration in the book that has a similar kind of vibe to to that. Um, but yeah, it's it's also pulling from the sort of classic Faustian bargains and um, looking at like pacts gone wrong. Um, where ult- ultimately, like this person, either has power that they shouldn't have, or uh, has got terribly unlucky, and in being unlucky, has now become lucky. Um, and it was it was just looking at how how we could get that kind of the luck element across in a in a monstrous form. So that that was the main one. Um, also looking at things like gambling and and, and monsters that had are, are tied in specific ways to luck in that regard as well. Mm-hmm. And I, I suppose the I suppose the other the other aspect to dip into with something like the lucky devil is the is is those sort of those sort of live fast vi- um pe- folk, folks who you might who you might see commonly in any story any story in ve- in Vegas who um Believe that they figured out a way to cheat the system, and sometimes they have. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Like uh, the, uh, the your sort of your your sort of dab hands, uh, card counters, and the like. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, we, we we've definitely played a few a few characters when we've been playtesting this that have been like that. Uh, either gamblers who have become sort of cursed or. Uh, have maybe made a pact to pay off a debt, um, uh, and it, that 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 it gives you that really nice luck element. And then some of the mechanics are are, are gambling based as well for some of the abilities. So it allows you to sort of bet and gamble luck points. Yeah. 
Oh, the next one on the list is the oddly undead, which I think some I think the the art that's used might might give some people a go, a um ghost rider vibe, which um which as tempting as that would be, ghost rider isn't undead, so I couldn't I couldn't count him as, as that, but um the um Joseph Creed in this in the song Drink with the Living Dead, I think would apply just as well. And incidentally, it's kind of amusing how a lot of old west horror can bl can blend in with gothic horror. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. So the the, the odd land that is uh, is kind of an exploration of the other side of the coin to the immortal of like what what if you're just per permanently dead but also still here. Mm -hmm. Um. So we're looking at um the idea of like it, it kind of emerged out of a conversation about what would it be like to play like a skeleton. Um, like a classic, you know, the classic fantasy, like, enemy, like a skeleton warrior. I was like, oh, was, like, just wandering around as a bag of bones would actually be quite fun. Um, so we, we, we thought about um, thought about that, but also things like revenants and zombies and ghouls and, uh, and, and these, these, these things that are ultimately dead, um, but still, still knocking about. Um, so we wanted to, to explore, explore, explore that kind of, that kind of idea as well. And there's been there's been a fair few. If I'm if I'm being honest, I think maybe it's just me, but if there's one character in comics who I think would embody the embody the um, that kind of undead archetype, even if it's an overpowered version of it, um, Spawn. Yes, yes, that is a that is a good example. Oh, it certainly be that would certainly be an incredibly powerful version of that character. Certainly, yeah. Oh, and be beyond that, I've I've dealt with my own things. I had um, I've I do rem I do remember one of an early character I had I had um in a different game who was basically the basically the Grim Reaper's bounty hunter. Okay, yeah, I like that. Oh, because the the idea of the the idea of the bounty hunter just go just going across the front going across the frontier is something that I th I thought would be an interesting way to put a more supernatural spin on it. He, he's not he's not doing it for some for some great cause or anything. It's just hey, I got to get paid. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Yeah, wanted dead. <laughs> mm -hmm. And of course the the last one is the is the slayer, which I'd say I'd say a lot of a lot of people um, would probably have the idea of it of the slayer focusing on one specific type of monster because that's the way a lot of hunters and slayers have worked in fiction. But I get the feeling that you've that you've set it up where it can be it can be a bit more generalist if need be. Yeah, absolutely. We give because you because you a lot of players are going to be playing playing the adventure. Uh, it's, a, it's a massive gothic sandbox. Um, and, and most of the time, as a slayer, especially when you're creating a character and you're receiving that hook for a gothic story, you're going to find out that something bad's happening in some place, and you don't, they don't know what it is, uh, but it's killing people or whatever it is. Um, uh, and so, building your character, being like, yeah, it's absolutely 100% definitely vampires. Uh, and building your slayer to kill vampires and then turning up and it's werewolves suddenly makes your character feel very like useless and so we built in that level of like more generalist like monster hunters than than a specific i hunt i hunt vampires and that's the thing that i do yeah i, I don't think you i i don't think you want to have the same trap that say the ra the ranger class tends to fall into where they have mm. their favorite enemy, but if they're not fighting their favorite enemy, they're um, they're low tier at best. Yeah, yeah. We we wanted to focus on things like um, the idea of slayers being able to research things that they know they're going to encounter to become better at them. Um, you get that trope quite a lot in in uh, Monster Hunter stories, where there's there's the the bit where we after we've encountered the foe for the first time, second ourselves to the library and learn about the the lore of the creatures and the weaknesses. And it, it, it allows you to strengthen your character, but it also allows for that interesting, like, expositional role-playing element as well. 
It'd be amu it'd be amusing if, um, and I'm I'm not saying that this should be in the book, but it'd amu it'd be amusing if if um if Sla if Slayers had an optional um trophy system in certain campaigns. Something I might do. Oh, so like a um like a a uh almost like a charge based system where like you'd have abilities or things that would get better the more monsters you slay. That would be interesting. More of, more of certain be certain benefits that you get from from collecting tr from collecting trophies of monsters. So in in a in Spy Home, we actually do have a system for that. Um, there is a key character in the city who is somewhat of a information broker, but also a dealer in the occult and the esoteric. Uh, and we will have various uh, sort of side side quests that that character will give in exchange for information or or uh, equipment and things of that nature. Uh, a lot of those involve trading for for monster parts. So I think that's that's a one place where the the monster hunter is really going to come into their own. Yeah, and from what I recall, there were a f there were a fair few. Um, there were a fair few advanced versions of the, of archetypes in the core book. Is that something that's that's going to that's going to be the case here as well? Uh, advanced in what or what way do you mean in terms of the the level that they can reach or um, like a hybridization? The hybrids is one thing which I can I can easily see I can easily see transferring over that that wouldn't um. That wouldn't ha that wouldn't have too much difficulty, but I'm more I'm more referring to the to the to some of the specializations that were within that were within archetypes. Mm. Yeah, no. So we are we are going to have some level of specialization. Um, more as you get towards the top of the tree, I, it, it will depend on kind of the the design and specificity of certain. Monsters, because some monsters have very specific abilities that are quite difficult to to codify across multiple different characters. So, for example, using the Invisible Man as an example, uh, the Invisible Man is all about being invisible. That is the core core element of that character, mm -hmm. and so that that's going to be quite a specific tree. Whilst if you are looking at say the beast, for example, you can be a lot more generalist when when you're making abilities for uh, um, a character that fundamentally needs to transform and become more dexterous, fast, or deadly, uh, and that there it's a lot easier to cross over those abilities. So, like much like the the core book, where we have some some trees that like cross over and and are much more easier to dip in and out of, and some that are much more straight up and one 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 specific specification it, it will be very similar in, in that regard as well yeah and um, but i am i am guess i'm guessing that things like being able to turn invisible and the like would fall into the purview of backgrounds so it, it depends it depends where you want to put the mechanical crunch of that idea the other, so if, if you want your character just to be able to turn invisible and have no other abilities beyond that then you could place that in the background. But if you wanted to, for example, show a character becoming more and more engulfed by the experience of their self-experimentation and slowly add abilities, and maybe you, you became invisible slowly over time and maybe you started by being partially invisible or sometimes you can control it, mm -hmm. then you could apply that to a, an ability tree instead. Yeah. And I, I suppose what I suppose what I meant when it came to specializations, I do want to correct myself, is things like paths in the in the core book. Yes, yeah. So we will have some specialization paths in the core book. Um, one of the things that the 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 stretch goals is allowing us to do is is we're expanding the the breadth of the skill trees for each uh, the ability trees for each of the. The monster archetypes to 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 give us that level of specification. All right, I I can get I can get behind that I can get behind that, um, and I'm get, 
in that in that same vein, with the when it came when it comes to those trees, I'm guessing they'd be not too far removed in ter in terms of in terms of size. Like you'd still be able to fit them on one page. Yeah, absolutely. Because we, we want to make sure that they're they're still usable um, and not not becoming a sprawling kind of flow chart. We also want want them to be easily. Um, they need to be easily cross applicable um, with the ability trees that are featured in the core rulebook. Because if people are hybridizing their archetypes across, so that maybe they're half monster, half human, or similar, um, then we want they, they need to marry up in that respect as well. Mm -hmm. Oh. Given the fact that you're using a different set of symbols, I'm guessing that you're going to be doing a character sheet that's more that's more leaning towards Shiver Gothic in reflection to that, especially since you're doing a new set of dice. Yeah, so we'll, we will be working up a a new character sheet in the Gothic mode uh, as well, with with some slightly different graphics and the the new the new symbols. Um, one thing we did want to make sure we didn't do though is that um, we didn't want to much like previously where we designed the dice apps so that you wouldn't have to roll, uh, you wouldn't have to have the dice if you didn't want to, um, to play the game. Um, the the monster dice don't actually have a specific mechanical um, application. They're just a, they're a cool kind of like, I know for, for us when we've been testing with them, it's, uh, uh, oh, if I'm going to do something monstrous with my monster character, I'm, I'm going to roll my monster dice, but if I'm doing something more human, I'll roll my normal dice. Mm-hmm. Now, a bit of a long-term question that I have is, have you guys considered down the road wor um, integrating some, integrating that dice system that you guys have with certain virtual tabletops? Yes, so we have been looking at VTTs. Um, one of the issues we've been running into is uh, getting the symbolic dice onto certain platforms. Um, so it's, it's something that we have... Um, a developer that we're talking to with um, at the moment, um, and we're hoping to bring that sort of live into the world soon. Um, but it's 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 proved slightly more tricky than we'd hoped it would initially. Which is understandable. the The closest thing that I ever did with it was ad was adapting was adapting the table system that Roll Twenty has with it. Which I'm go I'm gonna be flat out honest was rough. <laughs> yeah, so this is we we found that a lot of people are, um, will play with the dice roller and then will will have kind of a custom character sheet on some of their platforms. We did have somebody build I think in Foundry um, their own dice roller, um, which is in our Discord. Um, somewhere being, I think, tested with 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 some people. But yeah, we are we are hoping to get 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 stuff to some virtual tabletops. So that the issue is because there's not that there's several different virtual tabletops that people use. The development's obviously completely different for each of those for getting the dice on. So it, it's 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 a it's a a an interesting task to try and work out how to get it to the most amount possible. Mm -hmm. And which is cer which is certainly understandable, and obviously trying to do trying to do this, especially with a symbol based system, is not going to be an easy task, no matter what um, VTT you use. Yeah. Now, shifting into the disciples of um, Dreg of Dregstone, um, I'm curious. I'm curious. Um, what as I under as I understand it, it's it's less of a codified setting and more of a and more of a collect more of a collection of mini stories. So, to an extent, the the Dragstone story and the way Dragstone is set up as an environment allows players to drop in and out of sessions much easier. Um, Essentially, because the entire thing is collected by a, a, a labyrinthine um, network of sewer pipes and various other pipes from the city above, mm -hmm. um, it allows players to Goonies-esque disappear and reappear at, at a moment's notice. 
um, which we'd designed specifically for when uh, you're playing your spy home session and you need to run a, a secondary B plot adventure because you're missing a player because they the the classic RPG not everybody is available problem. Um, so it's it's it. It is. It does have a through narrative, um, and the reason it has a through narrative is because um, the the occurrences in the Disciples of Dragstone book happen within the timeline of the Secrets of Spirehome story as a whole. And so, if players want to expand the Secrets of Spirehome story, they can dip into the the Dragstone story um, at a relevant point in the plot. Uh, and it will have effects on that plot going going forward. Mm-hmm. And I, um, as as a bit, the other the other um, thing that I'm, the other thing that I'm curious about when it since you mentioned Spireholm, um, I'm guessing that within that within that book you'll have you'll have um, a few a few seeds in order to set that particular area up at for campaigns. Yes, absolutely. So, Secret of Spy Home's got a a uh, a massive campaign within it within the book, um, and also has uh, the, all of the lore for the city, all of the locations. Um, we've got a a map um, of it that should like glaze it all out for you. Uh, and this is kind of part of a plan for it to have a, an expar- expanded narrative universe for the for shiver players to jump into. It will allow them like a sandbox to tell any particular gothic stories that they want to tell. Mm-hmm. Now, I'm cu- one of the o- one of the other claims to fame that Shiver has is the do- is the Doom Clock, and what I'm curious about is how is how something like that would be integrated within. Um, Within ship within the more gothic end of Shiver. Sure. So for gothic, um, the Doom, the Doomcock kind of for your shorter gothic narratives, it still 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 holds true. Uh, still works the same. If you're if you're telling a short a short story of a sort of an Edgar Allan uh, Poe kind of style story, but if you're going for a, a much more longer sprawling gothic narrative. Um, what we've what we've developed for Shiva Gothic is a uh, a method of doom tracking that allows you to tell a longer story and have doom affect it. Uh, so the way we've done this is develop something called the Doom Calendar, which mm-hmm. allows you to take multiple doom clocks and tie them into a singular um, doom tracker. So in the Secrets of Spire Home, there are multiple chapters to the story. Each chapter. Uh, is designed to hold its own doom clock with its own doom events. And then depending on how players perform in terms of managing doom and how well they're um, keeping sort of the darkness at bay will determine how much doom from that doom clock is carried into the overarching doom calendar. Um, Then the doom calendar ties into uh, things like the stability of the overall story. Um, So if you're ticking up the doom calendar, things like um, perhaps there's uh, armed guards on the streets. Perhaps people are less likely to give you information. Um, maybe if you're getting high enough up, your 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 base of operations is destroyed, uh, and it allows you to provide um, later down the road narrative um, narrative effects uh, that have been caused by the player's actions much earlier on in the story. Mm-hmm. Now. With the, with that in mi- with that in mind, and because that does re- that does resolve a a um, issue an issue that was that I felt was going to crop up since the Doom Clock and the way that's set up um, definitely has a bit more of a slasher leaning, and Gothic horror is far more about the slow burn than it is about the quick flare. So having a Doom calendar. Is cer- is certainly encouraging. Yeah, absolutely. I think when you're when you're designing a longer story, though, you you do you do have 
potential for those like smaller burn um, kind of elements. Mm-hmm. Um, so you, you you do have the the ability to um, kill off a key NPC in a char- in a in a in a chapter or um, make it more, make a, a thing that the characters needed to achieve their goal more difficult to acquire. Um, and so the Doom Clock really does like still work very nicely within the chapters. You just, you if you think about chapters as almost a small story within a larger story itself. I I yeah, and I can certainly get I can certainly get behind that particular idea. Now, what do you with Sp- with um Spireholm and Dregstone? What are you shooting for as far as a page count for both books? Uh, so, Spirehome is going to be quite large. It's, it's definitely going to be over two hundred pages. Um, it's it's a it's a it's a big book. We've got a lot of story in there. Uh, Dregstone um, is is probably going to sit somewhere in a similar size to the Cursed Library, um, but it may well expand um, depending on. How far we get with stretch goals, um, we've got some plans to maybe add add content to, well, to both of those books really. So, but they're, they're both going to be a, a pretty hefty size. Dragstone will be a little bit smaller than than Spy Home, um, but Spy Home will be, uh, I would say, uh, as big as the core book, if not bigger. Mm-hmm. And what? And with that in mind, what are you shooting for as far as a release window for the project? So the the aim for the project is I want to have the PDFs for Spire Home uh, with backers for October. Um, ideally, I'd like to get those to people for Halloween so they can start exploring that um, sort of over that period because that's always good fun. Uh, I know that we have lots of lots of people saying that they love they they want to run stuff over Halloween for their friends. So we wanted to make sure that we tried to push for that as hard as possible. Um, the actual physical release, um, we're aiming for July of next year. Um, hopefully, we're going to be able to achieve that uh, a, a bit earlier than that. Um, but we, with the kind of difficulties that we ran into with uh, COVID-based logistics over the last uh, last year with this with the original Shiver Kickstarter, we just wanted to manage people's expectations and make sure that we weren't. Uh, weren't weren't over promising too much if we ran into similar issues which we don't think we are going to we're hoping we're going to be able to deliver earlier um with regards to other pdfs um after october we're planning to uh, release pdfs as soon as we've got them ready um so that people have got everything um to read through while while we wait for the physical products to to kind of get where they need to be um, similarly, obviously, if, if people are backing Shiver for the first time and picking up their PDFs, we're planning on distributing core rule books and any products that are already made and finished um, in a PDF form out uh, as, as soon as the pledge manager is is, is closed. Yeah, I, I can certainly get that. Oh. But with that said, I would like to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come onto the show and enjoy enjoy the madness at play here once again. Well, it's 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 been great fun. I feel like the uh, the monastery is absolutely a fitting environment to chat about Shiva Gothic. So it would be rude to to not take up that opportunity, really. Mm-hmm. And anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory. But it is encouraged. Yes, we'll we'll absolutely take you up on that when uh, when hopefully we're back again in the future with some more role playing goodness to talk about. Mm-hmm. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then. On behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody!